welcome to At the Table, a play reading series, brought to you by Charging Moose Media. This week, we're sitting down with the playwright of Sparrow Song, Peter Charney. Be sure to listen to this fantastic play and our interview with cast members Terry Burrell and Sam Tadaldi on previous episodes. Enjoy! We are so happy to be here today talking to Peter Charney, who wrote this week's, this week's, you saw, you heard last week. I can never figure you out heard, the chronology of our own podcast. You heard it a week podcast. ago. You heard it a week ago. A week ago, ago but, but it, you we heard, recorded it just like a day Listen, ago. in many ways, time is both irrelevant, a flat circle, a thing of the past. And in that way, you might be currently listening to Sparrow Song by Peter Charney. And we are so glad to be here today speaking to Peter. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for for looking at this piece. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and before we get into it, Peter, because Rachel broached the topic, tell me, how do you view time? What is the object that time takes for you? <laughs> oh well, Did you know, we t- prep you for that question? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But I, you know, I don't know if you actually wanted an answer. I mean, time time is such an interesting concept, and like in all of my work, it kind of plays into an effect. And I'm I'm sort of exploring how I can keep thinking about that. But this, you know, this piece especially, like, I think feels timeless in a way as it could take place right now or, you know, in many years in the future. And then hopefully uh, we don't we don't need it to. But sure. I love that you gave him a snark question and he gave you a beautiful answer. How dare you, Ned Donovan? And thank you, Peter Charney. Thank you very much. Oh, no, (laughs) no, no, no. I love time. So interesting. Yeah, and it it plays so critically in this piece. I especially, well, we'll jump into the piece of it, but I loved listening specifically to two characters with such different understandings of time all around them. That was one of my favorite things about about any two-hander, but about this two-hander in particular. That was um, one of the first things. Yeah, it was one of the first things that hit um, when we were reading through here. Um, Let's go back to big brushstrokes and just uh, introduce, I'm Rachel Flynn. Oh, hey, I am Ned (laughs) Donovan. I'm calling in from Harlem and Uptown Manhattan. I am still in Brooklyn. And we are going to talk a little bit today about where you are, Peter, and how you are. And then we'll talk a little bit about the play you wrote, which is beautiful. And anything else you want to talk about, about your work that you're in the middle of or previously, anything you want to chat about. And then uh, just as a big heads up in case Ned didn't let you know beforehand, we will be asking you about your favorite quarantine snack, meal or food. Just whatever food is really getting you through the last couple of months. So just know that that's coming down the pike. I would hate for that one to catch you unawares. Although you just went into full like philosophy on time. So I feel like you'll be able to handle our snack question. No, I've been thinking about that one since, you know, I've been listening back to a lot of the other playwrights who have been on the podcast. And that question, I was like, I know they're going to ask me. I'm going to think about it for days. So uh, we'll, we'll see <laughs> what comes one, out. That's honestly the one that we want people to focus on. <laughs> and there's many different ways it could go. So we'll honestly, see. this is a snack podcast with a theater problem. Like that's, that's what great. It is. That's great. Yeah, I think that's right. I and think that that's like most re- theater people, though, too. You know how they describe <laughs> oh, themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Most theater people are snacks with theater problems. Yeah, absolutely. Peter, where are you calling from and how are you doing? Yeah, thanks for asking. I'm I'm calling in from uptown Manhattan. I'm pretty far up by Fort Tryon, the cloisters. And I'm I'm doing okay, you know? I mean, it it was a scary time back on March 12th to see sort of everything I've come to know and love and trust about what I do and and the world that I'm surrounded by all sort of come to a stop. And I'm especially talking about the theater industry and community. And it's been really interesting and inspiring, I think, to see the ways in which we have tried to persevere and carry on in new forms and mediums and continue to explore. But I'm doing okay overall. I hear a lot of people who have expressed sort of boredom over this time, and that's so the opposite of me. I'm I'm just trying to like catch up on lists of movies and books that I want to read and television shows and trying to like absorb so much material with this sort of forced break. Um, and so I, I hope if I ever say that I'm bored that someone will will slap that at me because there's so much out of there to <laughs> to learn and do. Um 
Are you finding you have the energy to do so? How does that interplay with like the broader circumstances of the world? Yeah, well, that's... I, I'm, I'm envious of you feeling like those lists are exciting as opposed yeah. to perhaps daunting. Well, they are daunting because I start with, you know, X amount of things and then it increases so proportionately that I, I feel like, you know, I can, I'll never finish seeing all the things I want to see and that will be a burden on me forever, I think. But no, I mean, every day is kind of different, right? I remember at the beginning of all of this, there was such a pressure from people as to whether they felt like we needed to be creating an active and productive, or if this should be a time of self-healing and coping in another way. And in some ways, the play that I gave both of you is sort of looking at that. But I think it's different. It's different every day for me. You know, sometimes you want to kind of do nothing and allow yourself to feel the scary feelings that, that you have about those broader circumstances. And sometimes, you know, you hope that you can use it to charge yourself and, and turn out and make something out of it. You know, I, I think I'm too much of an artist to not try, at least. Does that um, energize you at all? Is the act of trying or jumping in give you energy? Or do you feel like, does that come out of a sense of, not obligation, but a sense of almost duty to, to your work? Yeah, I mean, I... Like with this piece, especially, I was I was so hesitant to try to do something. I didn't want to like write a quarantine play to write a quarantine play. Sure. Because I didn't want it to be about me. You know, this came out of a, a necessity and a frustration of sort of going against that and resisting that urge. And so mm -hmm. out sort of came this thing. I, I mean, it's it's constantly changing. And I think I think what's been surprising and beautiful is like, when I, for myself, finally embraced this digital life and got on Zoom with some actors and because I'm, I'm a director primarily and started working on text and discussing and creating with other people in the digital room uh, as opposed to the room itself, you know, I sort hmm. of was shocked and surprised about how it wouldn't feel the same and it wouldn't feel normal, but it, it would be enough of a semblance to feel creatively inspired by other human beings and, and make those connections and find the, the light in this time. So I, I think once I've opened myself to it a little bit more, it's been an, an easier and more pleasant journey. As a, someone who kind of primarily directs, how much have you been writing in the past or was writing really like something you picked up during this time? I always consider myself a director first and I never really call myself a writer, even though it's something I always have done. I think a lot of theater makers have, you know, pieces that they've explored in a writing or creative capacity. But as a director, especially as an emerging freelance director, I've found that sometimes to have opportunity, I've needed to create them myself. And so there are pieces that I've written that I've directed. Most, um, most of the things that I've written as a solo playwright has been shorter pieces like this. Um, short form is easier for me. And I'm just now in this time trying to stop and be like, can I write something longer? What would that mean? What would mm -hmm. that look like? Um, but the largest project I've worked on in a writing capacity is a musical called Bright and Brave, which has been in development for four years now, uh, a little over four years. And we uh, last fall, we had a first production of that presented at Dixon Place downtown. We've been developing with them for many, many years. You had a first years. production after four years. What are, how ahead of the curve are you? Holy hell. That's Yeah, great. well, we did, well, we did, yeah, it was a small production, but every year we've Whatever. done, we've it's done a reading. Yeah, we did a reading and then we did a, a stage reading and then we did a workshop and then we did a production great. after four years. Um, and we got some nice press with it. But on that show, I'm the composer. So I, I wrote the score uh, with two other collaborators. And with this time last fall, I was also the director of it. Every other time up to that point, we had an outside director to sort of allow someone with a different set of eyes to come in and look at the work. And with this particular production, we, we decided that I should go in and sort of, and sort of play that, that directing role. Yeah, but that's that's a really exciting piece and the largest way that I consider myself as a writer. It is 
delightful to me that you have a hard time conceiving of yourself as a writer, especially in full length projects. So the first one you jumped in with was a musical, which was is a perhaps musical the, writer. <laughs> the most massive and also yeah. wearing a completely different hat. Can you talk a little bit about your composing process? Is Are you a keyboardist? I, I, I'm so yeah. fascinated by this process, especially as a, also as a director, that people work in such different ways, especially now. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I grew up going to piano lessons every Tuesday afternoon for <laughs> pretty much all of my childhood. And, you know, I think my my mother was always like hoping that it would turn into something. And I never knew if it would. But, you know, all throughout high school and and college, I would write little little melodies and little motif lines on the piano. Right. And I never wrote lyrics. Lyrics are incredibly troubling to me even now. Um, and so I, I finally <laughs> Troubling found, is a great way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Am, tr- I am troubled Troubling. by lyrics constantly. It's mm-hmm. it's impossible. I don't know how anyone does it. I tried on my own, and I'm like, this is nonsense. Yeah. So I, I eventually found someone who felt the complete opposite, um, <laughs> and that's and that's how a relationship was. And built. that's a collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and that's what's beautiful about it is that we know like just just a little bit about the other thing. For us, we sort of can only do that one thing, which I think allows a little more freedom for each other. But sometimes, sometimes in the, in the creative process, you're trying to explain something to that other person and you don't know the language, you don't know exactly what you're trying to say. And so that can be a bit of a hurdle, but it allows us to really bring the, the best of ourselves in what we do to a song that we're writing and and we, my collaborator Jack Salibi and I wrote all of these songs. Were the first sort of real songs that we ever wrote um, for anything, let alone this musical. And so we yeah. sort of taught ourselves like how to do how to write a musical by writing a musical and learning from failures and learning from mistakes and and turning around and making something that has generated a decent amount of excitement in the people that have seen it and know the project. I also can't help but think of how valuable it seems to me to be fluent in composition language as a director. Is that where, uh, is musical theater or music theater been where you spend most of your time as a director? Or is that kind of across the board? Where where are you, where is your heart and where have you been spending your time? Yeah, mostly in musical theater, you know, and in college, I sort of branched out and did a lot of other different kinds of things. And even now I do a lot of things as anyone does, but my real desire and passion lies in musical theater. And I think, as you mentioned, as a director, having now written a show, I can go into an already existing musical and have a very different specific lens with it and look at why this character's song is orchestrated this way. Why is it cello heavy? What is that telling me? What are the different accents and dynamics in the score? What is that, you know, what information is that giving me about the character and their, their journey? So I've always sort of, you know, as, as all anyone who considers themselves a multi hyphenate does, I've always sort of tried to blur one discipline into the other. And it goes reverse as well. Writing a song, my my lyricist is an actor primarily, and I as a director primarily. We start by saying, "What is what is the character saying?" He monologues as if he was performing, as if he was you know improvising what the character is feeling in that moment and the change they need to have. And me as a director, I go you know rhythmically, musically, what does this moment feel like in the story and the overall arc of the play? Yeah, so we always. We always, because we are not writers and composers first, we've, we've always tried to come at it from that very specific perspective as a way into that work. That's wonderful. That's a very, um, it's a process really grounded in sort of the kinetic energy of the show, which I think is a very cool way to approach it. That's really exciting that it doesn't start in a sort of two dimensional way, but rather envisioning what the sculpture is going to look like. I love that. Peter, where are you from? I grew up just outside of New Haven, Connecticut, and I've lived all around. It. Yeah, I've lived all around New Haven <laughs> County. When uh, when did you get to New York? I went to uh, Hofstra University in Long Island, so I guess that was coming to New York. And then I graduated there with a BFA in theater directing in 2017 and moved into the city 
right after there. So I've been here for, I think last week was like my three year, three year anniversary of being a, hey. a city person. Happy three year. Thanks. What a time to be here. What a time to be here. Is there, as somebody who grew up coming into the city, because I think that is a very specific way to first experience New York, are there theatrical experiences you remember either from when you were very young or until Hofstra that have really stuck in your brain? Whenever I get asked the question of like, what is the one thing that made me, you know, decide that I was going to devote a life to theater, I can't, I can't really pinpoint any specific thing only because I've just been doing it forever. My mother worked, um, when she was younger, she worked in costuming at Goodspeed. And and my dad is a professional magician. So he's an entertainer. And I grew up doing magic with him and learning how to be a showman. And, you know, as, as many people who land in other disciplines in theater, I started as an actor and did a lot of professional theater as a young person. And so for me growing up, part of part of growing up for me was getting on the Metro North every couple of weeks and going in for an audition. And, you know, a lot's changed since then, but in some ways it's still the core of, of that experience is still a part of my life. Uh, I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about Sparrow Song. Of course. Does this show take place during COVID or does does it take place in a different universe in a different set of circumstances for you? What I'll say is like when I when I wrote it, yeah, it was 100 percent about about, um, you know, the coronavirus shutdown. Since then, in the revisions that I've done with it, I've tried to make it broader and less specific to that situation so that it not only serves as a warning and reflection of what's happening now. It is hopefully a warning for something that could come so that when we are out of this and whatever sort of new normal we find, we, we, we allow ourselves to keep enough of a perspective so that we don't make the same mistakes again. Where did the conversation come out of? Because it feels like a, it's a conversation of a play. My random sort of writing tactic is that I, I free write dialogue first. I, I think I can think about an idea and a rhythm before I can define characters. And so with this play for me, it was sort of like allowing bits of that conversation to come to light and then going back and looking at it and saying, oh, these are the qualities that I see are coming from each of these characters. And these are now the the ways that I can push that into more of a drama in the sense of, of having a conflict in, in their relationship. Are these based off people you know, or is this kind of a, a character that came out of the wild? Very much came out of the wild. I mean, I think it, it was part of my resistance to writing a quarantine play that I was like, if I'm going to do this, I don't want to talk about people. I want to find a different perspective with it and sort of let myself work through my own feelings as a human through, through these animals. But, you know, I, I, I'm looking now at my, my fire escape out my window as many of us New Yorkers have, and it's in my bedroom, uh, in my apartment, which is pretty cool. And I just, there was one day I remember just like hearing the birds out there and hearing them chirping and taking note to how present it felt. And the little things like that, that we go through our days not noticing. And so those voices now, which suddenly sang to me, felt like a great way to to talk about this and to think about, you know, how how the other creatures in our world are affected by this and by anything that we as humans do. Um, that became very interesting to me. I realized while while writing. I think one of my favorite themes that you return to kind of throughout the discoveries that Yellow in particular makes, I, I love that this is a show at least partially around the concept of sitting with or being by um, uh, because that feels... To me, that's the crux of why it feels so relevant to COVID. It doesn't necessarily even feel like the where did they go is the piece of it for me. It feels like 
we haven't had as much hit as much quarantine content for lack of a better word we haven't been hitting quarantine stories in a very specific way um with the exception of one other piece i think so far and i think that was also by design on our part we haven't been as interested in those pieces but one one of the reasons i think this hits a beautiful spot in the middle of those two desires of wanting to speak to what's happening to us and also desperately not wanting to be in the midst of you know capital q quarantine art is that there is a certain amount of grief process and that 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 theme of sitting with or being by somebody's home without actually interacting or engaging feels incredibly resonant right now. Yeah, thank you so much. There's no question there. I just wanted to tell you that. <laughs> There's no Yeah. Yeah, it's for me one of the joys of the world is just being in the company and presence of of humans or animals really, but just like beings. And this play really for me, like I think about this a lot with COVID is like, I find myself doing the spatial awareness dance where I'm like taking wide arcs on a sidewalk to avoid people when I'm walking to the grocery store and I'm pausing at the bottom of stairs because like I could walk by the person coming down, but that's a bad idea. And in doing so, I've like removed a significant amount of my like uh, uh, close proximity contact tracing that I love about interacting with humanity. And uh, I, I thought about that a lot when I was reading this play was was even the fact that they're sitting on trees across the, the path from each other means that even they aren't really interacting with each other in any kind of close proximity. And, and uh, you know, yellow speaks to a longing for that. And uh, uh, I think that speaks to how I felt for the last 70 something days. And so for me, that's what jumped off the page. I, I in everything that I try to do, I, I, I seek to make work that brings out empathy and caring and, and that makes people feel less alone. And so I was hoping with this piece that whatever sort of take anyone had on it or however they emotionally engaged with it, that they would feel less alone in this time of isolation and they would hopefully feel a sense of hope or a cause to action to make things better. Mission super successful, incredibly. Um, so now that we've talked yeah. about art and how we are and where we are and all the stuff, here it comes. Are you ready? Are you feeling oh, comfortable no. ready? Uh, well, what time, is the, no, you're okay. Uh, this is not, nobody's going to hold you to this. Um, no. Uh, it's just going to make us all snacky. That's all this accomplishes. So what is the snack, meal, food, set of foods that either are getting you through the quarantine or you're thinking about throughout the quarantine? Such a beautiful question. I, I can't, again, I cannot emphasize <laughs> how important this is to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is. No, I, I, sadly, because I'm in, in New York City, I've sort of limited myself to just the grocery store that I have across the street, um, which is great, but it means that my variety is a little bit more narrow than what I would like. Um, but that being said, I love cooking, but I, you know, I've been making the same sort of things kind of over and over again. But in terms of snacks and stuff, you know, I'm kind of boring, but like, I love my ice cream every night. Um, I've been drinking a lot of beer as one does in these days. Um, what ice cream and what beer? Totally. Um, beer changes. I just had a um, magic hat, which was pretty great. Um, was it the number nine? It was the number nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, that's a good, I like that. I like that. Classic. I gotta, I gotta oh, keep yeah. tabs on that because, you know, it's good stuff. <laughs> really, really underground uh, beer beer uh, here. We gotta, we gotta shout Magic out to. Magic Hat number nine, the, the secret What winner. if they sponsored us? That would be great. Yeah, I let's get them I would love if Magic Hat sponsored the pod. 100%. Sponsor the pod, Magic Hat number nine. Yeah, they seem pretty cool. Yeah, and then ice cream, you know, good variety, but chocolate, coffee. I love coffee ice cream. Um, yeah. Any, like, vanilla with, like, chocolate and, like, like I do, like, the Snickers mixes or um, nice. what are some of the other good ones? There was a great one. There was, like, a dark chocolate truffle one that they <gasps> had a couple weeks ago, and I haven't been able to find it since. That's the what I'm it sounds like the It sounds like the, tal- the Talenti. Yeah, oh, the Talenti has it, a dark yeah. chocolate truffle. Oh, really? Yeah, I, the wh- Talenti dark chocolate truffle is a world changing experience. So, that's yeah. exactly what I'm thinking about. 
during quarantine. Yeah. He's getting more of that. Phenomenal. That's the answer. Talenti is a phenomenal answer to this question. We got there. Absolutely. We got there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. As is Magic Hat. I think you're really nailing it. This is a good, this sounds like a good quarantine to me, to me, to Ra- my mind. Rachel, yes. what's a, has anything switched up on your, on your snackiness since last we checked in? Oh, uh, great question, Ned. Mm-hmm. I tee up the hardballs. You know, I, I, a wonderful shout out to, this is sort of not, not as fun of a snacky answer, but several small restaurant wholesalers have opened up to delivery to individual residences during this time, which has been really, really clutch because we've been quarantining. I'm a little sick right now. Um, by the time you listen to this, listeners, I will be fine, but we're not going out uh, right now. And so it's been so lovely to get like restaurant wholesale from like farms, like nearby farms who also like have a hard time, you know, Union Square Farmers Market and places like that are not open right now, which is also a bummer. So to be able to have access to that has been, and I grew up, my parents were restaurant people. So like having all of the like supplies for the week show up in like a completely unrelated open cardboard box feels so like home (laughs) to me. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the best produce in the world. And it came in this like, like dental supply box and it's left outside my door. And it's just been like the, the best, uh, part of the week so produce i think is my horrible answer for the week great answer is that lame no that's great no brilliant. No, no no mine is normally like you've got good you've got good answers I, I, an important thing about this podcast i think is that all food is our favorite food yes that's my motto um ned what are you hitting up this week so i also have a beer answer peter you really you really touched on a on a theme of the moment uh i have been drinking the sea quench ale by dogfish it's a lime and sea salt beer yes and it is tasty excellent uh so and so good. that is my uh my especially because i'm i'm about to be driving to chicago for a thing and so I, I'm just eating my leftovers at this point. So I don't really have anything exciting because I can't go buy anything to replenish the things that I've already impulsively snacked on. So at least dogfish uh, sequench ale is getting me through. Amazing. Nice. Does anyone have any other foods that they feel strongly we should mention before we wrap things gushers. up? Gushers. I want gushers oh, so yeah. okay. badly. <laughs> I want okay. gushers. Gushers, um, sponsor of the pod, gushers? Sponsor of the pod, gushers. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to an old answer, um, which is that cheesy grits are still making They're still my... Just, checking back it, in? Been a couple weeks, cheesy grits? It's just never not the thing. Until I can sit down at a diner, that's doing it for me. I hope to be at that first diner sit down, Rachel Flynn. I mean, we're going to cry through that first diner. Peter, we're going to stop wasting your time. Um, it has been <laughs> such all. a joy to get to work on your piece this week. It, it was so lovely to get to listen to you speak a little bit about your work. And um, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, if you would like, if our listeners would like to learn a little bit more about you, your directing work, your writing work, maybe hear any of this music, um, where can they find you online? I'm on social media at pcharns, P-C-H-A-R-N-Z. Otherwise, my website is just my name, petercharney.com. And Bright and Brave, you can follow on social media as well. We're mostly on Facebook and have shared some song clips and things there and hopefully more music from that to come. Amazing. We'll have links to all of your social media, your website, and the Bright and Brave um, Facebook info uh, up on our website, which is www chargingmoosemedia.com slash at the table podcast. Peter, thanks for joining us today. Seriously. Thank you so much for having me and for continuing to create and make work during these times. It is so, so appreciated. And I'm so grateful to be a part of it. Oh, we're so glad to have gotten to meet you and hear your beautiful words. And I'm really, really excited to see your work in person. You both yes. as well. Can't wait. Be well, all. Be well. Be safe, everybody. You too. Goodbye, friends. You've been listening to At The Table, a play reading series produced by Charging Moose Media. For more information on our playwright, Peter Charney, visit our website at chargingmoosemedia.com slash at the table podcast. Link is also in the show notes. We are hosted by Rachel Flynn and Ned Donovan. 
Our artistic director and senior producer is Rachel Flynn. Editor is Ned Donovan. Associate producer is Megan Bagala. Music by Marcus Thorne Bagala. Special thanks to our playwright, Peter Charney. You can find us on social media at At The Table Plays. Please connect with us. See you next time.